Well, thank you, Aish. Welcome to you all. And I am so glad I didn't have to do that exercise. <laughs> so <laughs> congratulations to all of you for doing it. You know, this morning at the SDG moment in the General Assembly, we were challenged by poet Amanda Gorman, who dared us to do good so that the world might be great. She challenged us not to try, but to triumph and to go the distance. So think for a minute what it means to go the distance for anything we care about. Good health, clean air and water, safe communities, decent jobs, equity, nature. There is no path to any of that that does not run through education, not one. Yet we continue to have such gaps in investment, in innovation, in inclusiveness, in performance of our education systems. And we know that needs to change and change fast. Every child in this world as a birthright should be able to learn to read, to write, to do basic math, and to learn skills that equip them to participate and thrive in their economies and societies now and into the future. Malala asked this morning, how long will you make us wait? At the UN Foundation, we were very proud to support the UN Secretary General as he prepared his Our Common Agenda, really it's all of our common agenda, his plan for the future of multilateralism, which called for today's Transforming Education Summit. And at the summit, we've heard commitments that will start a desperately needed transformation, but it's only the beginning. And as we look to the critical halfway mark on the SDGs and the summit next year and beyond, it is crucial that we move beyond that start to something more ambitious and accelerated. And young people must be in the driving seat of that transformation, shaping the agenda, articulating what they need as learners, as change makers, and as designers of their own future. I'm very proud that at the UN Foundation, we've been able to provide a platform for young leaders, thinkers, researchers, activists, to work on the transformation of education and so much more. Now you've seen some of the next generation fellows that we're honored to support throughout this event. We've also joined forces with 20 of the world's largest youth-led and youth-focused organizations to form something called the Unlock the Future Coalition, and many of you are in this room now. In 2021, we released the Unlock Declaration, where we committed to building a high ambition coalition for young people and future generations. And one year later, I am delighted to announce that this coalition is a reality. And as you probably already heard this morning, is being officially launched here today, the Unlock the Future Coalition, with a reach of over 800 million young people around the world. I'll take it. <laughs> so, our world is young, and it's getting younger. And I'm just so excited to see what this coalition and so many others can do to serve as a powerful force multiplier for the kind of intergenerational action that we need, and to put their shoulder behind the critical asks and actions that we know are needed to truly transform education and so much more. So in this same spirit of intergenerational action, I am honored to introduce this segment and our first speaker. This segment, of course, brings together leaders and education champions at the highest levels to hear and learn and talk directly to young people and with young people who are on the front lines of this learning crisis. This power panel is co-hosted by His Excellency Nana Akufo-Addo, President of Ghana, and represented by the Honorable Ya Ose Adutwum, Ghana's Minister of Education and His Excellency Jakaya Kikweti, former President of the United Republic of Tanzania and Board Chair of the Global Partnership for Education, as you all know. So it is now my great honor to invite His Excellency President Kikweti to the stage for some opening reflections. Thank you. It's interesting, I have become a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> well, excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today, and a warm welcome to the ministers and other distinguished speakers. Our world has been dramatically altered 
In the past few years with the pandemic, intensifying climate change, and conflicts and crisis, I would like to especially thank our youth who are ably leading us today. Your energy, creativity, boldness, and innovation are most valuable, are a most valuable resource that the world has. The world has it to tackle the challenges confronting this planet we all call home. At the Global Partnership for Education, of which I'm the chairman of the board, our goal is to bring possibility and opportunity to every child, especially in low-income countries. Over the last 20 years, we have raised $11 billion and helped 160 million more children, especially girls, to go to school and learn. Because no, it's not only going to school, but it's also going to school and learning. We know quality education is at the heart of social, economic, and behavior change. From technology to ideology, our progress can be dedicated to innovators who thought critically, asked the right questions, and dreamt big people who were inspired by a teacher or challenged by a book. We are here to talk about transforming education. This is a global need. But we need to focus our efforts on the children who need it the most, including those who are marginalized by gender inequality, poverty, and disabilities. First, we must transform education at scale. How? By country leaders remaining unshaken on their dedication to finance education for future generations, despite the tough economic environment we are in. It is not enough to ring fence current education spending. Leaders must invest more to improve access and quality of education. By ensuring that our investment is efficient and equitable, we can boost prosperity over the long term. It therefore gives me great pleasure that His Excellency Nana Kufo Ado, President of the Republic of Ghana, has accepted to take over the leadership of the Heads of State Declaration on Education Financing and become a GPE champion. <laughs> we in GPE look forward to his leadership. At the same time, we commend the 20 Heads of State and Government who have already signed the declaration I encourage others to do the same. I'd also like to use this opportunity to thank His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta now former president of the Republic of Kenya. I thank him when he was president. His efforts to mobilize leaders on the continent and beyond to, in to increase domestic finance for education has been commendable. We, we got this commitment of the 20 countries through his efforts. That's why we look forward to better performance under the leadership of President Nana Akufuado. Second, we must join forces across sectors. A child needs to be well-educated, but also needs to be well-nourished. He or she needs to be safe and healthy. 
And she needs not to be resilient and adaptive. She needs to be resilient and adaptive to the impacts of climate change. We are far stronger and better together. As we continue to reimagine new approaches to addressing emerging issues, I urge you to prioritize action towards achieving the goal of transforming education of our education systems. We are at an inflection point which requires targeted, urgent, and sustained interventions. The actions that we take henceforth have the power to transform lives and is a chance to we is a chance we simply cannot afford to lose. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you to President Kikwete for not just for being here and for those remarks, but for your tireless dedication to young people, to education, and to fighting for a better future for all. We're very, very grateful to you. And I now am delighted to hand the floor over to GPE youth leaders and activists, Mariam and Nival Rehman, who will be moderating the next rest of this panel. So Mariam and Nival, please come on out. Thank you so much, Dr. Cousins, for your powerful remarks. My name is Naval. And my name is Miriam. We're GPE youth leaders representing Canada and Pakistan, and we will now be shifting into our first panel, From Fragile Realities to New Futures. Our speakers include Dr. Yao Osai Adutun, Minister of Education for Ghana, Joy Fumafi, Board Co-Chair for the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, Dr. Sima Lavong, Minister of Education for Laos, and Dr. Miguel Cardona, U.S. Secretary of Education. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. My first question is for you, Dr. Edison. Um, this is the microphone. Oh. My first question is for you, Dr. Adutwun. Um, Minister, I want to congratulate Ghana and your president for taking on the championship of the Heads of State Declaration on Education Financing. That's a really big step, so yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Multiple crises, including COVID-19 and the effects of climate change, have had an undeniable impact on the African continent. What are some key lessons for governments to ensure that moving forward, education systems are prioritized, well-funded, and resilient to crises such as the recent COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, thank you for a wonderful opportunity. I'll let the president know that you clap for him. Yeah. <laughs> Accept him to be a domestic champion for education financing. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be here. I'm grateful to uh, President Kokite and all the rest of you for making it possible for us to be here in Ghana. Uh, we have embarked on, we had embarked on a major education reform before COVID-19. Our nation began what was called the free secondary education. Uh, 60 years plus after independence, high school was the preserve of the rich and the well-to-do. And we had so many students, about 48% of them who could not step into high school for lack of resources. Uh, President Anado Danko Kufadu came and said something ought to change. Immediately, first year into his term, he introduced the free senior high school. We had limited facilities. There was no way the facilities that we had was going to accommodate all the students that we, uh, we had to accommodate. So we had to, from my experience teaching in South Los Angeles, charter school developer in South Los Angeles for over uh, 12 years as a CEO, I went to Ghana with some set of ideas. We introduced year-round schooling. We're able to increase the enrollment of high school students from 800,000 to 1.3 million. The same facilities. So COVID-19 came, of course, there are some setbacks, but what we are realizing is that COVID-19 is a blessing in disguise for Africa. It's telling us that we can no longer 
think of ourselves as just uh, enjoying the status quo and not doing what President Kokite did for Tanzania. We have to begin to take a look at how we transform our education system by using leapfrogging strategies. So how do you, with your limited facilities, provide high school education for all? Borrow ideas from around the world. Look at what has worked in various parts of the world. Don't reinvent the wheel, but be able to innovate and innovate yourself out of limitations of funding. And so beyond that, then we look at the quality of the education system. We are now using open education resources to really provide science education through virtual labs. So yes, we don't have money to build a science lab in every part of the country, but we want to do science. So we go to virtual labs with a partnership for UK Open University System. We created virtual science lab activities for our high schools, so that high schools in remote areas with that internet connectivity can also benefit. And we then came up with what we call the iBox, developing Ghana for Ghana. Uh, local hotspots are in high schools where you don't have to have the internet, but content that is on that and the iBox uh, is emitted about one square mile radius, and you can use any device to log into it and have quality uh, education taught by teachers who are well qualified from across the country. So, leapfrogging, that's the word that I will leave with you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Moving on to you, Dr. Um, Co-Chair Fumafi, we wanted to ask you, there have been several measures implemented globally to recover from recent crises. However, there have been other social impacts like you know, the increased gender-based violence and teenage pregnancies that we've seen as well. What proposals would you highlight to governments and other key players to respond rapidly to these emerging social challenges that we're seeing? Thank you so much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, you know, I believe that it is a serious dereliction of our duty as a society that violence, whether it's physical, psychological, online, sexual, is one of the biggest social challenges facing young people today. With 246 million children and young people experiencing this trauma in the one place where they should feel safe, that is in schools. Unfortunately, the converging crisis, of course, that you are talking about of you know, COVID, climate change, uh, conflict uh, globally, they are, make, they are all making the situation worse, leaving countless vulnerable children underprotected, cut off from any safety and support that they could possibly hope for, increasing exposure to online violence, physical and emotional abuse. But the good news is that over the past 30 years, research and proven solutions have been developed that can prevent violence. The Safe to Learn call to action captures five of these key interventions. One, implementing policies and legislation that will ensure safe learning environments. Two, strengthening prevention and response interventions at school levels that is online and even in crisis. Three, shifting social norms and supporting behavioral change in the community and at school, increasing and targeting resources for violence prevention across the board, generating and using data and evidence to inform action. So countries have demonstrated how this can be done. There are many examples we can give, like the Finnish evidence-based Kiva anti bleem program, Uganda's National Teachers Union that undertakes focused training programs to support teachers, teachers. I could share many of them. But I think the important thing is that the problem that we are facing now can be resolved, it can be addressed. My proposal to governments, to key partners, is to put violence prevention right at the center of the commitments that they are making now and tomorrow, and the, at the center of the actions that they are going to take, both as individual and collectively as partners, to create an environment that we can promise to our children, the world's children, that we are pro prioritizing them, even the most marginalized, that we are going to ensure that we are going to deliver a learning environment where they feel safe and supported and they can flourish and attain self-actualization. So let's make it safe to learn for our children. Thank you so much.
I'll now be shifting over to you, Dr. Simela Vong. The impact of climate change is becoming more evident in recent years, and with rainfall, storms, droughts, and flooding becoming more severe and more frequent. So how is the government of Laos incorporating climate resilient design measures in early learning facilities? Okay, thank you very much. Sorry. Honorable ministers, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is uh, my great honor to share uh, my idea about the impact of the climate change on the education and how we uh, prevent or to mitigate the negative impact of the uh, from the climate change. Uh, as you may know, in our country, we have not so big earthquake there, but we have storm, we have you know landslide, we have floods. So, uh, to respond to these challenges, in the national level, we set up the national uh, disaster management committee, which including almost every sector including the education sector. <laughs> For our Ministry of Education, we also have the uh, working group to uh, prevent the disaster uh, in all levels from the ministry, provincial, and also district level. <laughs> and we have also the uh, district and village education development uh, committee and so we join with this organization to mapping the high list area uh, to integrate the climate size and disaster uh, preparedness into our education system and also working with our network of education and building the capacity for the school principal and school teacher, uh, only Syrians in disaster risk reduction. And also working with student school community to implement school drill to ensure that uh, there is minimal damage from the specific and low knowledge disaster. And also we uh, integrate some knowledge about the disaster prevention to our curriculum in all level. Of course, we have some achievement, but we still have many challenges, especially for the resource to deal with this issue and also the experience. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that intervention. My final question is for Secretary Cardona. The lifelong effects of poverty and discrimination on educational and life outcomes can be dire. So what measures can we put in place to mitigate issues that impact learners, such as economic pressures, climate change, and mental health issues as well? So how does that work here, but also transcend into the international arena? Thank you. Uh, glad to be here with all of you, my colleagues and uh, uh, leaders from, from all over the world and advocates for children. It, not only is this something we should be thinking about, it, it needs to be the foundation of what we do as we reimagine education uh, in order to meet the needs of our learners. We must, number one, recognize education is a public good. And if we believe education is a public good, we must work collaboratively to address the obstacles that prevent learning. If a child is hungry, you feed them. If a child is having difficulty learning because his teeth hurt, you fix the teeth. If a child is suffering from housing insecurity and their family is struggling with that, you work with them on that. You see, the bandwidth for learning is diminished when there are other factors that are impeding emotional wellness. We saw with the pandemic that the emotional well-being of our children needed to be addressed. Mental health supports needed to be addressed. I'm proud that um, with the American Rescue Plan, $130 billion went to schools across the country with a priority of not only academic recovery, but also social and emotional well-being. Um, so what we should do 
and what we're doing here is requiring that as we reimagine schools, we don't go back to what it was before the pandemic. That wasn't good enough. Too many students failed because they didn't have the adequate support that they needed to be successful. And these children had aptitude, but unfortunately the, the effects of poverty were preventing um, their access. So we are supporting and we're funding full service community schools, schools that provide uh, housing support, that provide mental health support, that provide food support. Um, I recently visited a college uh, where I walked into a food pantry and in this food pantry, uh, students could, vis uh, could visit and get food for their families, for their children, clothes, uh, feminine products, diapers, uh, necessities to make sure that they can continue studying and they don't have to worry about those things. We must make it our responsibility to meet the children where they are and take them from there and help them reach their potential. Academics is a big part of it, but if we are not addressing the other factors that are impacting learning, then we're never going to meet that child and have him or her reach her potential. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. For that. Thank you so much, Secretary. And in fact, I'd like to thank all of our panelists because that brings us to the end of this first panel. Thank you so much for your time. So we'll now be shifting gears into our second panel, and I won't be moderating, but a familiar face who looks just like me will be moderating, my sister. She'll come out and she'll introduce our second panel. So I'll be using this, perfect. So our panelists for this next panel include Stephen Amello, CEO of Plan International, Dr. Obi Ezekwesili, President, Human Capital Africa, the Honorable Harjit Sajjan, Minister for International Development in Canada, and the Honorable Gaspard Twagirayetsu, Minister of State for Education in Rwanda. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I'll be starting off our... I'm the other one now. <laughs> but I guess you'll never know unless you know the difference between the two of us. So I could be Miriam, but I actually am Nabal. Um, I'll be starting off our panel with a question for you, Mr. Omello. Today's discussion has put forward some potential solutions to address key challenges for learners. Let's zero in on the one solution that elevates all the other results gender equality within and through education systems. Based on your leadership at Plan International, how can policies and programs effectively work together to ensure gender equality is core and center of economic and social development goals? Thank you very much, and uh, is okay? Good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, young people in the audience, uh, leaders, uh, and the panel, grateful to be here. I can't help but start with a very teary moment for me this morning uh, in the General Assembly when Vanessa, Somia, and Malala reminded us of the millions of girls who do not have access to education today. Uh, it goes beyond Afghanistan. There are many places where girls don't have access to education. It's a shame on us as a society. It's a shame on us as a community. It's a shame on us as an international community that we still allow that to happen. It must not happen. I say a teary moment because when we say that we must bring gender transformative education into our system, there are core two elements to it. And this is not just Plan International, but many stakeholders are engaged in this, including the tremendous support from GPE. But one is a very stark data that we got this morning, and I think it's important that we reiterate on it again. But we need reminded us again that 4,000 new infections HIV infections in sub-Saharan Africa, that 60% of that impact adolescent girls. 
Now, so when we talk about the idea of bringing into our education system sexual reproductive health and rights, this is not a joke. It saves lives. When we say that we want to bring into our education system comprehensive sexuality education, it is not a joke. And when we are challenged why we speak about comprehensive sexuality education, this is exactly the reason why we are saying it. And so for Plan and others who are investing heavily in providing and working with other stakeholders, in not just in advocacy platforms, but working with governments to ensure that the curriculum and the different standards and protocols include this idea that we must begin in a very responsive age talk about sexual harassment and the idea of choice and freedoms, especially in bringing in gender equality across all spectrum of what we do and teach in school is incredibly important. And what thrilled me today, and since early in the week when we started this TES summit, which in my viewpoint, I've never seen such a brilliant summit that, that highlights issues on education with the momentum that TES has created. And what impressed me most, that's why I believe that we have made a breakthrough, is that it is government-led, that all the governments are on the platform pursuing the same agenda in saying we must include this. And gender transformative education is core in this and it's so pleasing. And so when I was challenged yesterday by a young advocate from Africa, why we talk about comprehensive sexuality education and saying it cannot work in sub-Saharan Africa, I put up my hand and saying those days are gone. It can work and it must work. And it's led by the governments, it pleases me, and community-led as well. And so that partnership for us is incredibly important to pursue this idea that we can integrate gender equality in our education system. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. My next question is for you, Dr. Ezek Wasili. The world faces multiple and overlapping crises right now as human capital and education systems are pushed to the brink. How can government, private sector, and philanthropy align action so education systems work for learners and create a win-win? I believe that the key word is collaboration. Uh, I, every time that we think about solving problems in our world today, uh, we have come to the conclusion that uh, siloed approaches are suboptimal in, in terms of outcomes. And one key outcome that we want to see with education today is really the, that people are indeed learning when they go through the school system. And so uh, when you look at the role of the private sector in our world, it's basically private, private sector driven by the incentive to, uh, to be profitable. Now, what would ensure that profitability competitiveness and productivity, right? What would enable competitiveness and productivity? It would depend on how much people have learned. What are we seeing in the science of learning? The science of learning is telling us that making sure that at a foundational level that people are started off with the science of learning, that the skills that they need to learn. So it means that private sector must now be an important part of the corrective measures as well as the new measures that we must take based on evidence that's available on what works. The accountability for good outcomes in learning has to be one thing that makes the private sector want to be part of the conversation on education because those who learn are the ones who are going to be the great innovators. And the private sector is dependent on new ideas for the kind of structural change in economies that we're seeing around the world. Thank you so much for your insightful um, comments here. Now on to you, Minister Sajjan. Uh, many governments are grappling with constrained fiscal space following the pandemic and other needs that are impacting populations around the world. So how can donors modify their approach to supporting education globally and ensure learners are in indeed at the center of these conversations as well? Uh, 
first of all, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here w with all of you. And thank you for putting this uh, event on. Um, I think the real question is that, uh, uh, what are the consequences if we don't, if we don't invest? But we, well, one of the things I want to add to this is, when we look at education, we can't just look at education onto its own. We got to look at, we got to make sure that uh, 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 the people are fed in the schools. We got to make sure that they're healthy and that they're educated. All goes together. Um, and, and, and so when it comes to uh, the, the investment side, the investments that we make, you know, sometimes we look at it, and I'm going to be uh, very crass about this, is that, oh, it's a nice thing to do, you know, we got to help people out. No, we got to turn this whole thing around, right? Look at all of you right here. Uh, actually, the ones that stayed up, um, most of us older people kind of sat down, right? <laughs> all of you are uh, obviously high achievers, right? Uh, achieving, uh, and you got more goals ahead of you, right? What's the difference between all the girls uh, and the boys that are out there who are not going to school? It's lack of opportunity. So the lack of opportunity is we are the ones actually th uh, losing out. There's no reason why they can't succeed. There's no reason why they can't, won't be the doctors to find the cure for cancer. And I say this with the utmost seriousness. There could be a genius out there, but they're just missing the opportunity. So for us, we have to invest, right? And we need to make sure that we invest and, and, and we reach everyone, right? Um, uh, the, this is not just about the lack of investment. It's, for example, climate change. I just visited Pakistan, right? And they're right now in the south, they're not only the kids that can't go to school because of the floods, but the schools are being used to house the people who are affected by the floods, so the kids normally go there can't also go to school because of the, uh, that. Or the schools have been destroyed in the north, right, and kids can't go to school. And, and, as a, and I was leaving, these girls were dressed in their uniform. They can't go to school because school is destroyed, but they're still dressed in their uniform, holding up signs saying, you know, please rebuild our school. Do you want to get educated, right? <laughs> And I've met others who used to be in there and are doing amazing work. So that every child on this planet, I firmly believe this, and if those of you have heard me speak about education before, I say this a lot, is that every child on this planet has a gift to offer this world. And it's up to us to invest in them, to give them that opportunity so they can find their gift, because ultimately, we're not just helping them, we're helping all of us. And we need to reach out. So we, this is a, it needs to be a priority for us, education, is the long-term ticket out for, not just for them, but for all of us. When we do this, they're gonna find solutions. Um, we're gonna, and, and poverty, we're gonna deal with climate change. So by investing in the younger generation, we are gonna solve the problems that are plaguing us today, and we're counting on you. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you so much. Now, Minister Togira Yetsu, all eyes will be on Rwanda next year as your country hosts the next Women Deliver Conference. <laughs> what are some of the key outcomes you would like to see come out of this convening and ensure that the world acts as urgently and collaboratively as possible to address some of the emerging issues on gender equality? Uh, thank you very much and good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to share uh, some report that came out uh, a few days ago. Uh, it ranked Rwanda uh, number six in the world and number one in Africa across uh, a few areas regarding women empowerment. Uh, and this is in education, health and opportunity, and uh, political participation. Uh, and that actually makes Rwanda one of the best places to be a woman uh, in the world. So I would invite you all uh, to, uh, to come with me uh, when we leave here. So uh, Rwanda is, uh, the, because of those policies uh, that have been put in place, uh, Rwanda leads in uh, the, numbers, the number of women in the parliament, uh, in the political participation, uh, and it seems like we are doing well. Uh, but we are always looking for opportunities to learn and share. So this is why we are very excited to host uh, the Women Deliver Conference next year. Uh, and there are many issues uh, to, uh, to look at, and there are many hopes to share uh, during that meeting. Uh, but since we are at, at Transform, Education, uh, the Transform Education Summit, uh, I would want to uh, raise um, a few numbers here. 
Uh, according to UNICEF, uh, we have more than 129 million girls out of school. And only 49% of the countries have achieved parity in education for girls in, educa in primary uh, school. So this is a very big problem. Uh, but at the same time, we also have evidence that shows us that if you educate women, this has positive impacts on many different sectors. So meaning that uh, when we meet uh, next year uh, in Rwanda, we would want to really look at girls' education because this is a very big issue and we want to make sure that everyone is rallied around that particular issue because there is evidence that uh, if we educate women, we are actually uh, bettering the world. So this is uh, something that we know and we hope that when we meet uh, next year in Rwanda, we will be able to have uh, that, those uh, types of conversations. Uh, and if you look at uh, some of the different projects uh, that are going on in Rwanda and across the world, uh, there, is, there is still something that we need to do. Uh, and first, we need to make sure that all these girls who are not in school go to school. We need to make sure that they go to school, stay in school, and while they are at school, we need to make sure that their learning outcomes improve because they are capable. If you look at the test results that we get uh, in our schools, girls constantly perform better than boys. Uh, so, but as, as they go up, we start losing some uh, because of uh, these social pressures or these social economic pressures that we see. So we need to make sure that uh, we eliminate those and when we meet, we hope that, you know, we will be able to raise conversations around those issues and make sure that we do what makes sense, which is educating girls. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Minister Federer. And a huge thank you to all of our panelists for joining us for this session. Thank you so much to everyone for listening as well um, to, to this important discussion and for highlighting the importance of education throughout this summit as well. So thank you all so much. And that brings us to the end of this discussion. The pleasure to announce that we have some time to spare for a quick conversation with these amazing twin activists, Miriam and Nival. So um, I have a few questions for you if you don't mind answering, just because you have such a fantastic story and I'm really eager to hear it. Sure. <laughs> we, can, we can sit. Um, I feel like I'll sit here as well. <laughs> um, so, okay, my first question, just a general one really. Um, what kind of made you get into this field? Like what like twin activists, like what made you kind of step up and start speaking out about um, the issues that you're concerned about? Yeah, so our journey actually began when we were eight years old um, in our village in Pakistan. Um, we had been visiting a girl's school that our grandmother had donated the land to build. Um, she was really passionate about making sure that girls had equal opportunities. And when we visited that school, we learned from some of the girls there that they were going to quit school when they reached grade five um, because they had to work to support their families. So I think that's unfortunately the case in a lot of communities across Pakistan, even if the will is there from the parents to send daughters to school and you know they want to support girls' education, they don't have the financial means to do so or you know, now climate change is serving as such a big barrier. Um, and so ever since then, we decided that we would try to fulfill our grandmother's dream for ensuring those girls went to school. We would go back and um, have conversations with their parents, as well as other community members, and try to figure out what ways we can ensure that those girls continue. Um, the teachers were really supportive as well, so they waived the fees for the girls to go, and you know all of these things. And it's been a journey of over 13 years now. Um, and a lot of the girls are actually now going on to high school, um, and it's been incredible to see their commitment to ensuring that they continue. Um, and so that was our work in Pakistan that really kickstarted our activism journey. And every time we would, you know, we were mostly in Canada growing up um, and we would only visit Pakistan on family trips. But uh, that's when we decided that we would also get involved in other uh, community organizations in Canada. Um, now we're a part of GPE as youth leaders and focusing on education here as well, as well as Girl Up, which is an amazing UN Foundation initiative. So, yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's so great. It's um, fantastic to get a bit of extra time to hear about your stories. I, you are excellent moderators, but um, yeah, just uh, really great. And I think it's interesting that you say that once you started the conversation, that the teachers and everyone else were really kind of willing to support. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just that kind of importance of starting conversations when we're, when we're creating change. Um, I'm going to touch on something that you kind of mentioned very briefly um, about kind of how climate change is affecting um, Pakistan. I know uh, for those of you that don't know that Pakistan has been um, kind of ravaged by floods at the moment and it's a really serious situation, but I think I would be really interested to hear more about your kind of perspective on that intersection between climate change and education and how that's kind of impacting your messaging now. Mm, for sure. What we've seen is that climate change is destroying communities globally, but especially those that don't seem to be contributing the most to it. So what we found is countries like Pakistan who contribute less than 1% of global carbon emissions, they're the top 10 countries who are most affected by the impacts of climate change, and that's devastating. Um, not to say that anyone should bear the brunt of climate you know, disasters or anything like that, but just the in inequities we're seeing in terms of who's contributing to climate change and who's facing the consequences, it's just really sad to see and in Pakistan what we've seen now is extreme flooding uh, more than 33 million people are displaced as a result of this flooding and they don't have access to their schooling all of these resources are being destroyed and in our recovery processes it's important to not only give basic needs like food and shelter attention but also how are we getting those children back to school how are we making sure that we're able to you know do long-term protection of their rights as children to be able to go to school and have that education so that's really you know it's a devastating aftermath of climate change. Um, we're also finding that you know, climate change destroys education, but education is one of those things that can help combat climate change as well. So they're in, like intrinsically connected in that way and that relationship is very strong and very clear. And that's, I think, in part of the recovery process um, for countries around the world, as you're supporting Pakistan, that makes the importance of education even more clear and it's even more important for us to uh, continue supporting climate change recovery processes that incorporate education or comprehensive climate education is also part of that process. So yeah, there's lots of intersecting issues there, but um, I think right now Pakistan is one of those, it's at the front lines of the climate crisis and it's, it's happening now. It's not something that we're seeing in the future or something that we can predict is gonna happen. That aftermath of climate change is very clear for a lot of people uh, in Pakistan right now. Yeah, it's so interesting that you say that. Um, I mean, not just climate change, but I think the recent like COVID crisis uh, kind of revealed that one of the first things to stop suddenly in the face of emergency is education. And um, it, we still haven't kind of recovered from that. And as countries increasingly face the effects of climate change, this is a kind of problem that's going to affect more and more places. But especially, as you said, the countries where the, they are least contributing to the actual effects of climate change. That's really interesting. Um, and I have kind of, I know that you've kind of said that you've been able to create a lot of impact and there's been organizations like GPE, Girl Up and things like that have supported you. But would you say that you've faced any uh, barriers in your journey as, as activists? I think one of the main issues as um, a lot of uh, as activists that we face is getting people to rally around a cause. Um, I feel like a lot of young people who have been here at TES as well, we hear a lot of um, support verbally and a lot of leaders say that yes, they support education for example or they support climate action but they're, we're not seeing those actions, not urgently enough. Um, and so I think that's a big barrier and it's really disheartening as activists too because we spend so, we've spent so much time advocating for these issues. We see the impacts on the ground so many people are influenced by all of these things and we all we can all agree that education is a right that you know all students and young learners had, should have access to but um, we don't see that action there and it's, it's you know it's something that we really need to work towards not like moving beyond the words and you know translating those into actions and um, I think making you know the priorities need to be um, on these issues like education as well we were mentioning before that the world rallied around uh, COVID-19 and rightly so the actions that we saw there were really important everyone was working together and that's exactly the kind of urgency we need for you know the climate crisis, the education crisis that's going on. Um, and I guess just our message to leaders would be to take those actions, be bold, 
don't be afraid to step up for these these issues that we all really care about as activists. I think that's the biggest barrier that we see because, um, you know, it's very very easy on some days to feel that our work isn't having the impact that we would like it to have. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's the that's the biggest thing right at the moment. Yeah. And I think just adding on to that, the youth perspective is welcomed at spaces like this. And honestly, it's a privilege for us to be here too in these spaces because sometimes that those youth cannot make it. Uh, a fellow GP youth leader was not able to come due to issues um, like visa issues or whatever the political situation was. And I think those types of things, it's, priv it's a privilege for us to be here too and we recognize that. Um, but at the same time, while we're here, we recognize that, you know, how do our words translate into actions? I think that's something that Naval touched on as well, but what more can we do? From world leaders, we expect you to take those actions because you're in those positions of power. When we're there, then that'll be our responsibility. But for now, we're encouraged to participate. We're encouraged to give our voices and give our perspectives. But what more would you like from us? And what is it that we can do to, to get those actions in there? So I think that's something there's a little bit of a, um, expectations that we have from our leaders, but yeah, that's something that we, we really, um, that's, the, that's a barrier for us as activists because, again, like Naval was mentioning, that feeling of, I don't think this is working, or I don't think, how do we solve gender equality? How do we take climate actions? I think the research is there, we can agree on a lot of these things, but again, the action is where we fall short, and we would really encourage our leaders to, you know, step up and um, make us proud with your actions. So yeah, that's something we really encourage you to do. Um, yeah, so kind of, I know that you've both had the pleasure of meeting quite a few world leaders. I know actually your first video on your YouTube channel was an interview with yourselves, President Trudeau and Malala Yousafzai, which is a, an excellent video to debut with. Um, but yeah, you've had the pleasure of meeting all these world leaders, but what would be your advice when it comes to, uh, um, like for other young activists, about really getting them to listen? Like what makes them understand, as you said, the need to like rally around issues like um, education and climate change. Yeah, d definitely. We've had a lot of really incredible experiences. Some of them, you know, they just came out of the blue, to be honest. But it, I, I think it's um, we weren't expecting those uh, those opportunities, but they were a result of a lot of hard work that we put in and hours that we put in as activists. And our advice to other young people is to use storytelling to inspire actions and to get the attention of not only world leaders but other folks who can support you with with whatever issues that you care about. I think storytelling really brings people together. As humans, we really use stories to understand each other and increase empathy towards a lot of issues that we care about as well. So we would encourage encourage you all to use storytelling, use your own social media platforms in whatever way you can to really raise awareness about the issues that you care about. I think that's the biggest tool you can use. Um, we have a lot of you know, social media and uh, tools available to us, TikTok, Instagram, use it all to reach the leaders that you want to reach um, and your voice will eventually get heard. So. Yeah. And I think just building on to that, um, just touching again on the importance of storytelling, I think when we first started our storytelling work, it was because we realized that there was a there was a uh, need to bridge the gap between the problems that exist in the world and what people can do to help. So in the media, what we find is sometimes the awareness building is there, like this is an issue and um, you know, girls' education access is an issue globally, not everyone has access to education. The climate crisis is something we might learn a lot about. But where we fall short sometimes is what people can do to help. So sometimes what we, we reach a point where there's a little bit of a um, desensitization towards these issues because we learn about so many of them and it gets to a point where it's overwhelming, you don't know what to do about them, so then you just give up, or you're like, you know, perhaps I, there's so much to do, I, like there's, or I don't even know where to get started, and I'll just like pause it there. I've, I've learned about the issue, I'll donate, that's, that's it. But that's perhaps, that's not enough sometimes, and what we need to do is bridge that gap so that people know what to do about those issues as well, and that's where we came in with our platform, whether that's, you know, speaking to your m like members of parliament, or fundraising if that is the solution, or advocating and making sure that other other leaders know about why this is important, petition signing, whatever that looks like. I think that um, storytelling bridges that gap as well, and the right type of storytelling to ensure that the solutions are something we focus on as well, because I think yeah. sometimes if we focus too much on the problems, that leads to a desensitization, and if we don't address issues like in terms of what their solutions are, we're not solutions oriented, then those solutions or the issues won't be solved too, so that's important as well. 
Yeah, I mean, those are some fantastic tips, I think, for like any young activist, but storytelling is a general method of communication for anyone interested in, in changing um, things in the world. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, and you've, you kind of mentioned this like very, uh, like in your last segment here, um, Miriam, about feeling overwhelmed at times. I'd be curious to know um, whether this kind of activist lifestyle that you've chosen is in fact, a, like d does it take a toll on your personal lives? Um, and if so, like, do you, how do you manage it? Um, I know that you're both, for example, flying out to London next week to start studying abroad. So you clearly leave, like, very lead very busy lives beyond this. So yeah, I'd just love to know a bit more about your kind of personal balancing. Yeah, it gets, it does get a lot, um, and I'm sure that a lot of activists and people within this uh, policy-making space can agree that, um, especially when you're working on a lot of these issues and you see the challenges all the time, it can get really, really difficult, but I think focusing on the wins is what really helps. Focusing on the things that have been done or the progress that has been made and really taking time to celebrate them, that really helps. Um, I think also balancing between um, you know your work as well as um, I, for for young activists, it's school work or whatever that looks like your your activism, all of these things combined. Um, so taking breaks is really important. I think that as much as we want to overwork ourselves and continue doing the the things that we that we need to do for you know improving the world, um, taking breaks will help you do them more efficiently or in a better way so you know taking care of yourselves I think we've adopted a little bit more of a balance now than we than when we first started and it has really helped us continue and you know stay um, you know sustain this process of you know being activists and uh, continuing this journey as well yeah and I think just one more piece to add to that would be um, uh, just because problems in the world seem too big to handle or there's so much going on that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do something to create some sort of change. So I think believing in yourself and your, doing your part, I think it's, it's a little bit cliche, but I think it's very important to emphasize that because sometimes we forget and we think that the problems are too big and our contribution is not gonna be enough, but that doesn't mean it's not important or necessary in order to get to the places we wanna get to, so yeah. Thanks so much. I, sorry, yes, no, absolutely. <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, just thank you so much. I personally do feel, I guess, a bit more hopeful and knowing everything that you're doing, not just for your home country, but for young women in education and for people suffering from climate change um, across the world. So it's been a real pleasure to chat to you both and I'm wishing you all the best in the future. Thank you so much thank for so joining us. Thank you all for listening as well.